Hello, everyone. Um, thank you for that wonderful introduction. Um, today, we're going to talk about colon cancer, um, the preventable killer. Um, and again, my name is Sim Betty with Gastroenterology of the Rockies. Um, so as you may, uh, may be aware of um, March's Colon Cancer Awareness Month, um, you may have seen um, uh, things on social media uh, about colon cancer awareness, um, hashtags, and, and um, other um, uh, things on social media talking about colonoscopy and other screening modalities. Um, but to go back, in 2000, President Bill Clinton officially dedicated March uh, as National Colorectal Cancer Awareness Month. And in 2019, Governor Jared Paulus uh, signed a proclamation declaring March Colorectal Cancer Awareness Month in the state of Colorado. Um, and so every uh, March, um, you, you may see the Denver uh, City and County Building lit up um, blue, amongst other buildings uh, across the state. Um, to start, um, kind of an outline, um, we'll, we'll discuss how colorectal cancer is common, lethal, and preventable. What is colorectal cancer? Um, and again, to start, we'll look at a diagram of the colon. Um, here, you, you see the entire colon. Um, the entire colon is approximately five feet long and is divided into major segments, as we can see here in the diagram. There is the cecum on the right of the colon, um, the ascending colon, transverse colon that goes all the way across, descending colon, sigmoid colon, and the rectum. And the signs and symptoms that we worry about with colorectal cancer include blood in the stool, um, changes in any, any bowel habits. Um, so, you know, if you're having uh, alter, alternating constipation or diarrhea, um, that is a sign. Um, changes in the shape or size of stool. Um, so, you know, if your stools become more pencil, pencil thin um, or, you know, you have, you have more pellet-like stools, uh, that may be a sign. Rectal pain, abdominal pain, any unexpected weight loss, um, not related to diet or exercise, and uh, any unexplained or new anemia. And anemia is uh, when the hemoglobin, one of your blood counts, is, is a little bit lower, um, and it could be due to colorectal cancer. Um, and so what we recommend uh, for screening is the colonoscopy. And when we do a colonoscopy, um, we may see on the left, you can see um, some polyps and on the right as well. Um, on the left, those polyps look a little concerning for a possible cancer. Um, and on the right, those are, those are more, um, uh, you know, probably more benign polyps um, or precancerous polyps. But gross appearance of looking at these polyps during a colonoscopy um, doesn't reliably distinguish the different polyp types in cancer. And so it's important to get a biopsy or have those polyps removed during the procedure when they're found. Um, the, uh, the progression of a polyp um, is, is outlined in this picture right here. Um, so on the left, you have normal epithelium. And by epithelium, we mean normal tissue in the colon. And as we go to the right, um, that tissue becomes more abnormal. And um, you, you start to develop something called an adenoma, which is a polyp. And that adenoma then progresses to become a colon carcinoma, or cancer. And um, most colorectal cancers will arise from these adenomatous polyps. Um, and they progress from small to large polyps, uh, just like shown in the picture. Um, the progression from adenoma to colon cancer may take on average 10 years, um, which is why we recommend that the interval between colonoscopies be 10 years apart. Um, and adenomatous polyps are pretty common. Um, they occur in about 20% of women and about 30% of men. Um, and so statistically speaking, you know, if you're one of those 20%, um, you know, you'd, you'd ideally like to get a colonoscopy to have them removed so that they don't progress into cancer. Um, colorectal cancer is very common. Um, globally, it's the second most common cancer in women and the third most common cancer in men. It's overall the fourth leading cause of, uh, of cancer in the United States. And roughly 145 or 150,000 Americans will be diagnosed with colorectal cancer annually. Um, and in Colorado, we'll see about 2,000 new cases uh, every year. And at the top, um, the new cases, it, what that means is that, that 1.7 million Americans will be diagnosed with cancer um, uh, you know, every year. Um, and in Colorado, we have about 28,600 
Coloradans that will be diagnosed with, with cancer. And out of those, uh, 1,900 will be diagnosed with colorectal cancer. What we're seeing is that the incidence over time has decreased, actually, um, in those over 50 um, by about 40% since 1987. Um, and, and, and this study was actually done by the American Cancer Society. And what, what we're seeing is an uptick, actually, in, in cancer incidence in those that are ages 20 to 49 by about 51% since 1994. Um, and that's why, you know, with, I think with the advent of, of colonoscopy and the advancement of, of, of screening modalities such as a colonoscopy and other stool tests and things like that to look for colorectal cancer, that's why the incidence has actually been decreasing in those over the age of 50 because they're coming in to get their colonoscopies done and ha having these polyps removed, um, therefore um, reducing their, their overall risk for cancer. Um, and on the right, um, you know, we're seeing that uptick in, in, in younger patients under the age of 50, and that's, that's a big reason for the push to decrease the uh, screening age um, from 50 to 45 years old. Um, and the uptick, we, we think, may be related to unhealthy diets and uh, sedentary lifestyle um, in those that are younger. Um, so colorectal cancer risk factor. So um, ju just to, to kind of review, a risk factor is anything that will raise your, your chance of getting, can uh, of, of getting a disease such as cancer. Um, and different cancers will have different risk factors. Um, but having a risk factor doesn't mean that you'll get the disease. It just means that you may have an increased chance of developing the disease. And for colorectal cancer, we know that demographics are important. Um, so country of origin, age, so male, male, uh, you know, male sex and uh, race and ethnicity, we know that minorities are, are uh, more likely to, to develop colorectal cancer, low socioeconomic status, um, and family history. Um, and I think out of all of these, uh, family history is probably the most important. Um, so family history, uh, and, and colorectal cancer risk. Um, so this, this, um, this uh, graph here shows uh, the overall um, risk increase when you have a FDR, which is a first degree relative with colorectal cancer. So overall, the lifetime risk uh, for an average American uh, to develop colorectal cancer is about 5%, uh, whether you're a man or a woman. Um, and so when you have one first degree relative um, with a history of colorectal cancer, um, your risk increases to about 10%. And when that one first degree relative is less than 50 years old, that, that risk increases to about 15 to 20%. And when you have two or more first degree relatives uh, with colorectal cancer, that risk shoots up to 50%. Um, and so that's why when you're discussing things with your healthcare provider, your physician, uh, you know, it's important to discuss these kind of things uh, to let them know, hey, you know, I have a first degree relative, um, mom, dad, brother, or sister, or even your children um, that, that were diagnosed with colorectal cancer. Um, and, and that will trigger them to get you put on a screening program um, a lot quicker. Um, so to go back to the risk factors, the other important risk factors are lifestyle and diet um, and a fa failure to get screened. So we know that colorectal cancer um, is common, but, but it's also lethal. Um, and in the United States, overall cancer deaths will be about 606,000 annually. Um, and about 50,000 Americans will die from colorectal cancer every year. In Colorado, uh, we see s similar statistics where about 8% of Coloradans will die from colorectal cancer, or about 660. Um, and when we discuss colorectal cancer, um, we look at the staging of, of, of the cancer. So um, we stage it from zero to four. Um, and uh, though we highlighted that early detection of polyps is key, early detection of colorectal cancer is also important. Um, to catch it before it metastasizes. Because when you hit stage four colorectal cancer, you have spread to other organs in the body, including lymph nodes um, and other organs like the liver. Your five-year survival when you have stage four colorectal cancer is less than 5%. If we were to catch your cancer early um, at, as, at a stage one or a stage two, um, your risk uh, your your, your five-year survival is, is a little bit higher. It's on, on the order of 70 to 95%. Um, so, you know, 
even though you know you might not be getting your colonoscopy done at 50 for screening purposes, um, you know you're you're never too young to get your colonoscopy done. It's never too uh, too late. Um, so this these statistics alone make it one of the most deadly cancers if not detected early. Um, again, and to go back to the the risk factors, um, diet and lifestyle are modifiable risk factors and. By modifiable, we mean that these are risk factors that um, you can change. Um, so these are things that you can change in, in your life. So, you know, low physical activity, you know, you can you maybe exercise more, smoking alcohol, maybe cutting back on those things, and changing your diet. Um, so again, those are modifiable risk factors. And we know overall that um, being overweight and not physically active have both been linked to colorectal cancer. Um, diets that are high in red meats, such as beef, uh, pork, lamb, or liver, along with processed foods like hot dogs and lunch meats, will also raise your colorectal cancer risk as well. So we recommend a plant-based diet or a Mediterranean uh, type of diet. Um, those who uh, smoke, uh, smoke tobacco, are also more likely to develop and die from colorectal cancer than those who don't. Um, and we've also noticed that uh, moderate to heavy alcohol use is also a modifiable risk factor for colorectal cancer. Um, so what we recommend is limiting alcohol use to no more than uh, two drinks per day for men and one drink per day for women. Um, so we discussed the, the risk factors, um, but there, are, are, there may be some protective factors as well. Um, and so aspirin um, for selected groups has, has been, you know, you may have seen, seen this in, in, you know, in the news. Um, there have been many studies that have, have found that people who regularly take aspirin um, may have a lower risk of colorectal cancer and polyps. Um, but we don't recommend the aspirin for the sole purpose of colorectal cancer prevention. But if you're already on aspirin at the direction of your healthcare provider, um, it may give you that added benefit. Um, but remember, aspirin can cause serious or even life-threatening side effects, such as bleeding from stomach irritation or stomach ulcers. Um, so we definitely recommend um, that you, you don't just start taking aspirin for colon cancer um, screening, or I mean prevention purposes, and that you discuss things with your healthcare provider to see um, whether they recommend it. But screening is also a protective factor as well. Um, and so we'll go through some of these uh, screening uh, modalities. So prevention and early detection we, we discussed is very key. Um, so early detection, there are stool tests, which you uh, probably have uh, seen on the news, um, or uh, in, in commercials, rather. Um, but there's also imaging uh, that can be done, along with the colonoscopy procedure. Um, so we'll go through some of the screening modalities that can be used. Um, so the stool tests, um, there are three major stool tests that, that are used. Um, the fecal immunochemical test, or the FIT test, uh, which looks for blood. Uh, the guaiac-based um, uh, fecal occult blood test, the hemocult test, which is all the way to the left, uh, which is done usually in, in the office. Um, and the Cologuard test, which is a multi-targeted uh, stool DNA test, uh, but it also includes the, the FIT test as well to look for blood. And if any of these tests come back positive, a colonoscopy will be advised for further evaluation. So um, if, you're, if any of these tests come back positive, uh, you know, this becomes a two-step test um, because the colonoscopy will be necessary um, as well. Um, so uh, the guaiac-based uh, fecal occult blood test uh, will test for hemoglobin or blood in the colon. Um, and the test will identify if there is blood in the stool. Um, but it's important to remember that blood in the stool can be due to a lot of different things. Um, so it could be due to hemorrhoids, um, you know, or you know, other other things that could be bleeding in the colon. Um, so it may be be, be false positive. Um, so you might get a positive test um, that you know you might not even have um, colon cancer, and uh, you know it might might uh, lead to further testing like the colonoscopy. Uh, the FIT test is going to look for blood in the colon, um, and so uh, you know that is also an important uh, you know uh, you know thing you know just like the Guaiac stool test it, it you know might may come back false positive as well. Um, so the uh, the the Cologuard test or the multi-targeted uh, stool DNA test with FIT 
Um, you may have seen this on the new on, on the the media, like the uh, uh, the um, uh, commercials and things like that. Um, so that test uh, will look at multi-targeted stool DNA. So it's going to look for for um, DNA um, linked to colorectal cancer, um, along with um, the FIT, which tests for blood. Um, and if so, if both of those come back positive, you know, it's going to trigger uh, that you know a colonoscopy be done. Um, the this diagram shows uh, the colonoscopy procedure. So you have a a flexible scope that's going through the, the colon uh, to look for polyps. The colonoscopy is the gold standard for colon cancer screening and detection of uh, any precancerous polyps. And the procedure involves a bowel prep and clear liquid diet the day before the procedure. Um, and the day of the procedure, you may be given an anesthetic, uh, so you'll need a ride to and from the endoscopy center where you're having the procedure done. Um, and wh what we do is we take a flexible scope that has a camera and a light on the end of it. Um, we insert it through the anus and we take it around the whole colon to the right side of the colon, um, all the way to the cecum, which is on the left of, of uh, the colon in these diagrams. And then what we do is we slowly withdraw the scope um, and we carefully look at each fold uh, to look for polyps. And if a polyp is found, uh, we'll remove it on the spot. So uh, colonoscopy therefore is a, a one-step examination. And here's a picture of a polyp in the colon with an instrument um, that is uh, used uh, to remove polyps. There's also the CT uh, colonography test. Um, and with this test, uh, you know, we're, we're taking uh, multi, a lot of slices, uh, you know, imaging slices of, of your abdomen, um, and we're piecing it together to make a 2D and a 3D image. Um, and what, we're, what, what is done then is, um, uh, you know, a, a radiologist will take a look at the image and uh, will assess for any polyps in the colon. Um, with this test, bowel prep is still necessary and required uh, to help clean out the colon. Um, and when you go into the uh, the the, radi the radiology center, they uh, they will inflate the colon with air by sticking a. Um, a tube into the rectum. Um, it's either air or, or CO2 to inflate the colon um, so that uh, polyps can be detected with the CT colonography. Again, if that test comes back positive, it becomes a two-step test because a colonoscopy will have to be done after. Um, so going back to kind of the, the, the risk of uh, colonoscopy, uh, I mentioned before that at average risk, average American uh, with no family history of colon cancer or personal history of any polyps or inflammatory bowel disease, um, the average risk is about 5% for, for the average American. Um, so it's important to get the history uh, when discussing colon cancer screening in order to risk stratify um, you as the patient. So when you go in to talk to your doctor, um, they may ask you these kind of questions. And a, a patient's uh, considered average risk if there's no personal history, family history of colon cancer or inflammatory bowel disease. Uh, inflammatory bowel diseases include Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis. Um, if you have ulcerative colitis or Crohn's disease, you're, you're above average risk. Um, and in general, uh, the, the, the population who are average risk will start colorectal cancer screening at 45 years old. And uh, you stop at about 75 to 85 um, at the discretion of your healthcare provider. And the options for screening, which we discussed before, the fecal occult blood test um, or the hemocult occult test, the FIT test, those need to be done annually. So every year you need to get that, those done. Um, and if they come back positive, you'll need to get a colonoscopy. The FIT or DNA test, the Cologuard test, um, can be done every three years if negative. Um, flexible sigmoidoscopy, um, it's done every five years. And um, what we do with that is we uh, take, take a scope and we get all the way to the, the splenic flexure, which is on the left side of the colon, um, but we don't do a full colonoscopy. And with this procedure, um, the preparation is, is enemas, um, but about 50% of polyps are located on the right side of the colon, so we're, we're, we're missing out on um, evaluating about 50% of polyps, which could progress to cancer. Uh, we discussed the CT colonography. If negative, um, it's recommended to get every five years. And the colonoscopy, if there are no polyps, every 10 years for screening purposes. And if, if any of these screening tests are done, um, the colorectal rectal cancer cases and deaths decrease by about 60 to 80 percent, which is substantial. Um, so again, uh, it's important to, to get um, screening done. 
Um, previous screening guidelines, so prior to 2018, um, the recommendation was uh, uh, colorectal cancer screening strategy starting at the age of 50. And the USPSTF, which is the United States uh, Preventative Services Task Force, it's a body of experts that work to improve the health of all Americans by making evidence-based recommendations about the effectiveness of clinical preventative services, like the colonoscopy. And prior to 2018, um, both the ACS, which is the American Cancer Society, and the uh, United States Preventative Services Task Force were recommending colonoscopies at 50 years old. And um, we uh, went over this uh, the study that the American uh, Cancer Society um, published in 2017, and what this study showed was um, that the incidence was increasing in those ages uh, 20 to 49, um, so under the age of 50, uh, of colorectal cancer. Um, and so what, what ended up happening was that the recommendation started to shift more towards uh, screening at the age of 45, um, because from their modeling studies, they found that starting at age 45, um, you know, it led to about a 48% decrease in the number of new colorectal cancer cases and about an 8 to 11% decrease in colorectal cancer deaths. Um, and this is with a 12 to 17% increase in the number of colonoscopies compared to starting at the age of, of 50. Um, so this was the big push for uh, why the, the screening age was, was decreased to 45. Um, and in 2021, just in November, actually, uh, the USPSTF changed their recommendations and lowered the recommended colorectal cancer screening age uh, down to 45 years old. Um, and this is, again, due to a recent uh, trend for increasing risk of colorectal cancer, those un under the age of 50. Um, and in 2018, uh, the American Cancer Society had changed their recommendations uh, and recommended adults age 45 and, and older with average risk of colorectal cancer to undergo regular screening. Um, and both screening guidelines also mention to individualize screening uh, with patients aged 76 to 85. Um, so, you know, if you're a healthy 76 or 80 or 85 year old, um, and your average risk um, and your life expectancy is, you know, more than 10 years, um, your, um, your primary care provider may recommend a colonoscopy. Um, um, so, you know, we individualize the screening age, but if you have a lot of, uh, a lot of medical issues, um, you know, um, that, that are ongoing, uh, your healthcare provider may not recommend a colonoscopy if you're over the age of 76. And in 2020, uh, the House Bill 21103 was signed, um, requiring insurance coverage for colorectal cancer screening at the age of 45 in Colorado in accordance with the recent changes to clinical guidelines. Um, insurance companies uh, have followed suit for the most part and are now covering uh, screening tests for those that are uh, 45 years and older. Um, now, to go back to risk, uh, risk groups for colorectal cancer screening, um, those that are increased risk, so those that have a first-degree relative uh, um, with colorectal cancer, um, uh, we generally start at age 40 or earlier, depending on uh, the number of, of um, first-degree relatives and, and the age at which they were diagnosed, that family member was diagnosed with colorectal cancer. And again, colonoscopy is preferred in these patients as a screening modality. There are some hereditary syndromes um, that we will start screening patients a little bit earlier, um, a lot bit earlier, actually. So age 12 um, to 25, um, and annual colonoscopies um, um, you know, in, in these patient populations. Um, and we recommend colonoscopy over stool screening tests um, in, in those that are higher risk. Uh, so again, just to reiterate, family history of colorectal cancer does increase the risk. Um, and uh, cancer tends to occur at an earlier age. On average, patients with a family member with a history of colorectal cancer will develop cancer about 10 years earlier, um, so we recommend screening at around that time. Um, there are some familial and hereditary uh, causes of colorectal cancer. Um, uh, hereditary re refers to any disease with a known genetic cause. Um, and, you know, hereditary non-polyposis you know, uh, is, is one. Lynch syndrome is one. And familial appears to have a genetic cause and will affect more family members um, than would be by chance alone. Um, so familial adenomatous polyposis is one example of that. Um, but overall, 
70% of colorectal cancer cases are still sporadic um, or there is no genetic component or family history uh, related to, to that colorectal cancer. And um, about 25%, there will be a first degree relative um, that has colorectal cancer, um, but there may not be a, a genetic component um, uh, at play. Um, and you know, less than 1% of patients that develop colorectal cancer will have FAP or familial adenomatous polyposis, making it very rare. Um, and along with Lynch syndrome, two to three percent uh, will develop colorectal cancer. Uh, just to go over um, uh, some of these rare causes, so Lynch syndrome, um, it's autosomal dominant. So again, it accounts for about three percent of colorectal cancers. Um, high risk of colorectal cancer, about fifty percent of these patients will develop colorectal cancer over their lifetime, um, and we know that. Um, they have an early onset of colorectal cancer, and on average, uh, they'll be diagnosed at around the age of 44. Um, proximal location, so majority of the cancers will be located on the right side of, of the colon, um, or where the cecum and the uh, ascending colon are. And there will be other cancers that will be associated with Lynch syndrome. Um, so uterine cancer or ovarian cancer uh, will also be associated. It's under-recognized, um, and uh, in these patients, we'll send them for genetic testing to look for uh, mismatch repair genes um, that could be, um, you know, uh, at play here. Um, screening works. We know that annual colonoscopy, uh, starting at the age of 25 or earlier, um, does lead to uh, decreased incidence in colorectal cancer in these patients. Um, another rare cause, familial adenomatous polyposis, extremely rare, um, 1 in 7,000 to 1 in 22,000. Again, it's autosomal dominant. Um, there's a high risk of colorectal cancer, about 100%. And as you can see here in the picture, um, there are thousands of polyps um, when we do the colonoscopy. Um, it's easily recognized when you do the colonoscopy. Um, um, and we recommend genetic testing or screening starting at around 12 and surveillance annually, and it, it becomes hard to, to do surveillance um, of all these thousands of polyps. Um, um, so these patients may require uh, colectomy or uh, have, have their colon completely removed. Um, and just to summarize, uh, colorectal cancer is common, lethal, and preventable. Um, it's the fourth most common cancer in the United States in Colorado. Um, the incidence is decreasing in those over the age of 50, but increasing in the young, and so that's why we're recommending um, screening at an earlier age now, at 45. It's lethal. It's the second most common cause of death, cancer death in the United States and Colorado, um, and that's strongly dependent on the stage of diagnosis. Um, so like I mentioned before, uh, we stage colorectal cancers, and if they're uh, stage four, um, you know, you have a less than 5% um, five-year survival rate. Um, it's preventable with prudent lifestyle changes, uh, so modifying your diet, exercising, um, you know, quitting, quitting tobacco and cutting back on alcohol use, um, it, it is preventable. And screening is the most effective prevention, as well as early detection. And I, I will say the best screening test is the one that gets done, whether it's the stool test, the colonoscopy, or the CT colonography. Um, and, you know, like I mentioned before, familial and hereditary colorectal cancer requires special attention uh, with, with more frequent screening um, and surveillance, um, and along with um, maybe um, uh, other screening modalities for other cancers as well. Um, and with that, uh, we will uh, take questions. Thank you very much for the presentation. We sure appreciate that. It was a lot of good information. We want to remind our audience uh, that they can ask questions uh, below the video, and we will try to get to as many of those questions as we can. Uh, these are in no particular order, okay. uh, and so we'll just get going with some of those questions right now. One that always comes in is, Tell us a little bit about the insurance coverage for this, please. So for, for screening tests, um, you know, starting at the age of, of 45, uh, we know that most insurances cover uh, the, the screening test. Um, some insurances may not cover it if you have a history of polyps. 
um, uh, because the, the, the test may be, be uh, looked at as a surveillance test or a, you know, more of a diagnostic study. Um, so ins insurance companies may not cover um, that, uh, you know, that procedure. Um, but if it's a screening test, for the most part, um, insurance companies uh, should cover the procedure. But of course, check with your insurance company to make sure that the uh, doctor that you will be getting the procedure with um, and the practice takes your insurance. Um, and that it is covered. So one more time, um, can you differentiate between screening and diagnostic colonoscopies and why insurance won't pay for some diagnostic? So diagnostic studies, um, so you know, think about um, kind of like a mammogram. If your mammogram comes back as an abnormal study, um, you had a screening test done, right? And that usually is covered by the insurance company, but now you may, may need an ultrasound or um, you know, some sort of uh, you know, other study to evaluate this thing found you know, in the breast. Um, so you might need a biopsy or something like that, and that becomes a more of a diagnostic test where the insurance companies may not cover that. Similarly, a colonoscopy, you, know, you have your screening tests where we, we may, may find a couple of polyps here and there. Um, uh, or we may be doing it for weight loss, constipation, diarrhea, rectal bleeding, and that's a diagnostic study. Um, so, you know, we're looking for a particular cause for um, uh, constipation, diarrhea, you know, rectal bleeding, weight loss. Um, and so the, the study is therefore a uh, diagnostic study. So we're trying to diagnose you with something uh, versus a screening test where we're just looking for polyps. Um, for a, um, it, you know, if a polyp is found, some insurance companies may see that, that, that colonoscopy that you're going to have subsequently as a uh, surveillance colonoscopy, um, where it's not a screening test and, and more of a surveillance or a diagnostic study. So they may not cover 100% that colonoscopy, but of course, check with the insurance companies to see if, it, if it's one covered, and also check with the practice where you're having the procedure done um, to see... Um, what the options are. Thank you. So several questions about, um, besides the colonoscopy, the gold standard, uh, about alternative tests. Uh, for instance, one person said, um, you know, what's your opinion of colon Cologuard and uh, are there a lot of false positives or false negatives with that particular test? Uh, any new innovations in testing? Yeah, sure. Um, so Cologuard, Cologuard, you know, it's a new test. Um, we don't have a whole lot of data out right now uh, about the Cologuard test, um, but what we do know is, is in the community, we're seeing about a 13% false positive rate. And so when you get the Cologuard test done and, you know, you're, you're you know, it comes back positive, you start to worry, you know, do I have cancer? Is there something else going on, you know, in the colon that could be making it positive? Um, and so, although it's a good test, there is a, there is a decent false positive rate that we're seeing. Um, it's, it's a good test. I mean, it, it's, a, it's a screening modality, um, just like the colonoscopy and the CT colonography. Um, but again, the gold standard is still the colonoscopy, which is, is the one-step test. So if the the Cologuard comes back positive, like I mentioned before, um, you now have to get the colonoscopy done. Um, and so, um, you know, it can be burdensome, um, you know, and to just have that in your mind that, you know, my Cologuard test was positive, do I have cancer, make you a little anxious and nervous. Um, the, uh, you know, I, there are some, some blood tests that have come out over the last few years um, that again, they have um, low sensitivity, um, so they have, a high false um, false negative rate, um, and so they're not not recommended at this time. Um, but again, colonoscopy is gold standard. Um, uh, fit test, hemocult test, and the uh, Cologuard test are still screening tests that can be done, though. Okay, great. Um, so, is there a higher or lower incidence uh, based off of ethnicity? and any, any difference also in possibly area of the country that you're living in? Um, we know that, um, you know, from, from the data that we have, um, that, you know, if you're, you know, a minority, um, 
living in some underserved areas, uh, you know, low, low socioeconomic um, status, uh, or low socioeconomic status, you, you may be at an increased risk. And uh, we think that the, the socioeconomic status part of things may be related to diet um, and just lifestyle. Um, so that, that piece of it, you know, that, that may be at play. Um, you know, minorities, um, there, are, there are certain groups that are at higher risk of, of developing colorectal cancer, um, but we still have kept the, uh, the age at screening at 45 for everybody across the board, um, whether you're, you know, uh, Caucasian, black, um, Asian, um, Hispanic, it doesn't matter. 45 years um, is the starting age for screening. Thank you. So you mentioned a symptom of blood in the colon. Um, are there other symptoms um, that are specific to colon cancer, um, or are the other symptoms also like possibly other, uh, other things that you may have? Yeah, sure. So um, other symptoms, you know, weight loss is one. Um, and, in, in changes in bowel habits, um, you know, those are the two things, and, and anemia as well. Um, so if you have iron deficiency anemia, um, along with some weight loss and any changes in bowel habits with rectal bleeding, um, you know, we worry about colon cancer. Um, so we'd like to get you in as soon as possible for a colonoscopy uh, to check things out. Okay. Can hemorrhoids and fissures turn into colon cancer if they don't heal? No. Um, not generally, um, you know, anal fissures and, uh, so anal fissures are, um, you know, they're at the anus, um, uh, not really, you know, they, they are slightly, you know, could be above the dentate line sometimes, which is the line that we look at, um, uh, distinguishing between anus and, and the rectum. Um, but, um, generally no, hemorrhoids and, and, and fissures, uh, will not put you at a higher risk for colon cancer. Okay. They'll be uncomfortable, but, um, you know, <laughs> it probably won't cause colon cancer. Okay. Thank you for that distinction. Does having divertic, divertic, uh, I can't say it, diverticulitis increase the likelihood of colon cancer? No. Um, so diverticulitis, when we do see it in patients, um, so diverticulitis is an inflammation of uh, the diverticuli in, in, the, in the colon, which are, which are these pouches in the colon that can develop over time. Um, and diverticuli usually don't cause any issues, but sometimes they can get infected and cause diverticulitis, uh, or they can bleed. Um, with diverticulitis, what we worry about is, um, uh, is there an underlying colon cancer in that area? Um, because when you go into the emergency department or your primary care doctor and you get some imaging done, um, there may be some findings that are concerning for, for cancer, such as um, enlarged lymph nodes um, and um, just haziness around the colon in that area. Um, so, we, you know, we will, uh, you know, your primary care doctor may send you to us for a colonoscopy to get things checked out, and that's what we do recommend about two, two months after um, you have an episode of diverticulitis. Uh, we do recommend a colonoscopy to just get thing, you know, get it looked at to make sure there's no polyps or cancers in that area. Okay. If a precancerous adenoma was found during colonoscopy and this person's father had colon cancer, should they have a colonoscopy every three or five years? So it depends on the number of adenomas um, and the type of adenoma. Um, for at, at baseline, um, if you have a family history of colorectal cancer, you should not you should you should, you should go no more than five years between colonoscopies. Um, but if you have um, three or more polyps that are adenomatous, um, uh, you know three to ten polyps that are adenomatous, uh, we recommend that your repeat col your next colonoscopy be in three years for colon polyp surveillance purposes. Um, and that's why the recommendation may have been uh, three years. Maybe there are three polyps found on your colonoscopy, three or more polyps found on your colonoscopy. Okay. Um, are there alternatives to the colonoscopy prep? Um, there are, are a few preps that are out. Um, there, you know, um, traditionally, um, you, know, you know, we're given the, uh, the gallon prep, the go lightly or new lightly. Uh, prep, um, which is about four liters of prep. Um, 
But you know, uh, some practices are using Miralax prep with 64 ounces of Gatorade. Um, you know, you take a whole bottle of Miralax and you mix it in a pitcher, and you 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 know you do split prep. Um, there's also Climpec, um, which are lower lower volume uh, Sutab, uh, 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 which is a, a pill that you can take to to clean things out. Um, we're not seeing uh, really good results with with the Sutab um, compared to the um, oral solution um, preps for colonoscopy. Um, but um, the prep, you know, it it it, it can be burdensome. Um, um, but you know, I think getting the colon cleaned out properly and effectively th that first time uh, may save you um, needing to get the colonoscopy done again for a poor prep. And also, you know, if nothing is found, you may be able to go about 10 years between colonoscopies um, rather than having other screening tests done yearly or every three years. Um, so I think um, you know, the bowel preps aren't the best, um, but they uh, they are effective. Yeah, cleaning cleaning out the colon for us. Okay. Um, what kind of anesthesia is used for colonoscopy? Okay, so you know there are um, you know there's conscious sedation um, where you know you're you're pretty comfortable for the procedure, um, and what we use are uh, fentanyl and Versed uh, to help keep you comfortable during the procedure. You're not completely asleep, though, and that's why we call it conscious sedation, because um, you know, it should be able to you know, wake, you know, wake you up and, and, and be able to talk to you, um, you know, in case I need to, we need to reposition you during the procedure, um, or you know, if you're in any discomfort, to let us know that you're in discomfort. Um, that's why, you know, one of the ways that we sedate you. Um, but there's also propofol, um, which is monitored at anesthesia care at the direction of an anesthesiologist or a uh, certified registered nurse anesthetist. Um, and with propofol, you'll be completely asleep and comfortable for the procedure. Um, both anesthetics are safe, though, um, and uh, patients do relatively well with them. Um, uh, yeah, so those are the two types of anesthetics that we use, conscious sedation and the, the monitored anesthesia care. So what do you typically uh, recommend and why one over the other? Um, it depends. So, you know, it depends on, um, we look at, you know, your, your uh, other medical issues. Um, so do you have heart disease? Do you have um, chronic kidney disease? Are you on dialysis? Um, do you have um, uh, any stroke history? Um, are you obese? Is your BMI over a certain amount? Um, if, if you have any of, 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 of any risk factors for having anesthetic complications, we'll generally recommend propofol. Um, but if you're a healthy, you know, 45 or 50 year old or 60 or even 70, um, you know, um, with very little medical issues, uh, we'll recommend conscious sedation because you know you'll still do really well with that kind of a, a sedative. Okay. And everyone's different. You know, some people you know react to sedatives differently. Um, so just because, you know, your friend had conscious sedation and they didn't do well with it doesn't mean that, you know, you won't do well with conscious sedation or propofol. Are you truly conscious? By, you're, you're, you're comfortable. You're, you know, you're taking a nap pretty much. Yeah. Okay. Um, it's a light nap where, you know, you're still able to be uh, woken up. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Great. So after a colonoscopy, how long does it take for your digestive system to recover? To recover? Um, some people, you know, they feel, they may feel a little, um, uh, you know, a little nauseous after the procedure, immediately after the procedure. So we do recommend that they eat a light meal after the procedure. Um, and we give, we give uh, these recommendations at discharge before um, leaving the endoscopy center. Um, but your digestive tract should go back to, to being completely normal after the procedure's done. Um, you know, you'll, you'll uh, pass some gas after the procedure because some air will be put into your colon. Um, that might be the most uncomfortable part of, of, of uh, you know, after the procedure, but um, generally, you know, you shouldn't have any problems after the procedure with your digest digestive system. So if you do end up having colon cancer. Um, what are the treatments and where do you go from there? 
so the the generally when you know when you do when I do find colon cancer, you know, I'll send you for some imaging, um, so CT scans and things like that to look for any other you know lymph node involvement if there's metastasis to other organs in the body. Um, but I you know I get on the phone with an oncologist right away, um, and they kind of take it from there, um, along with a surgeon. Um, and so you know they'll they'll recommend either surgery, uh, a combination of chemo, radiation. Um, yeah, no, but but they discuss things. We discuss things at a tumor board to see what the best uh, treatment option is based off of your age, um, something called your ECOG performance status. Like you know, um, how how active are you? You know, are you a good candidate and a good fit for chemo and radiation? Um, and what type of chemo and radiation we can uh, offer to you, and, and surgery. And do you do that in your clinic, or that's another uh, place? So that's that's through BCH actually, um, in, in Rocky Mountain Cancer Center. Okay. Yeah. Okay. How has COVID affected the availability to get a colonoscopy? Um, so initially, when COVID first hit, um, you know, a lot of the elective procedures were were put off um, and canceled, um, just because of you know issues with resources and um, you know amongst other things. Um, but at this point, um, you know, we're really haven't been affected by COVID. You know, if you want to get in for your colonoscopy for colon cancer screening or surveillance, um, you shouldn't have a problem with getting in to get the procedure done. So again, we want to remind our audience that if they have any questions, go ahead and add, add those to the chat box and we'll try to get to those when we can. Uh, here's one we haven't addressed yet. Um, does having parents with a history of polyps predispose a person to getting them? Neither of the parent had colon cancer. So it de depends on the polyp. So, you know, if this is an advanced polyp, um, uh, you know, more than one centimeters in size, or if there are uh, some features that are concerning for, you know, progression to cancer, um, sometimes we will recommend colonoscopies every five years in these patients. Um, uh, um, but yeah, that, that is an important thing. So, you know, when we um, discuss things in the office, we do ask about family history of polyps. And, you know, if you, your parent did have a polyp, you know, it's tough to, tough to know the size and things like that. But, you know, we do recommend that you discuss things with, you know, ask your parents, hey, how big was the polyp? Did you need surgery uh, to have the polyp removed? Um, was it an aggressive type of polyp? Did your, was your gastroenterologist concerned? Did they bring, bring your parent back? Um, after about six months or a year for their repeat colonoscopy. Um, these are all things that um, might, um, um, you know, uh, be high risk, you know, in the, in the parents and it makes you high risk as well. So uh, this guest has heard about uh, someone who had a colon perforation during a colonoscopy. Yeah. How common is that? So, you know, different studies will, you know, will, will give you different values. Um, on average, uh, we, you know, we see a perforation rate of about one in 500 to one in 2,000. It, it's pretty, pretty rare that it happens. Um, there may be um, some predisposing conditions uh, within the colon, um, you know, such as diverticulitis. Um, that could put you at a higher risk. Um, old age as well, so you know, over the age of 75, that is, that's a risk factor as well for uh, you having a higher higher risk of perforation. But it's very rare that that happens. Uh, when it does happen, do you just stitch it up, or what is the remedy for that? Depends on the size uh, of the defect. Um, so sometimes we can put a clip over the area. Um, you know, in very rare instances, you may have to go to the hospital after the procedure is done um, just for monitoring and maybe a CAT scan or an x-ray of the abdomen um, and uh, close, follow, close monitoring by a, a surgeon in the hospital. Um, you may need surgery, but it, again, it's very rare that that happens. Okay. So you mentioned an upper limit um, of having colonoscopies. Can you have one above that limit, like at 82 or 85? And why do you stop having it at the as you get older? Um, so the upper limit, why we recommend 85 is because uh, we look at overall life expectancy and um, 
Um, you know, so, you know, when you, you hit 85, you know, if you're a healthy 85 year old, your life expectancy may be another five or 10 years, um, you know, if you're super healthy. Um, so that's why we do recommend colonoscopies in, in those age groups. Um, colonoscopies for screening purposes, that is. Now, if you have um, some symptoms that are worrisome for colon cancer, um, you know, and you're over the age of 85 and, you know, you're a good fit for a colonoscopy, we may recommend getting one done uh, to evaluate for colon cancer. But not for screening purposes. So again, to, to reiterate, so uh, screening-wise, screening um, the upper limit is, is 85, but if you have some sort of a symptom, um, we may consider doing a colonoscopy if you're over the age of 85. Okay. Um, so our last question here is, um, if you uh, have a colonoscopy and you're okay, but then you start feeling something in between your next colonoscopy, even though it might be two years or five years out, should you still be in contact with your, your doctor or what is your recommendation on that? Yes, um, so there is a chance that a polyp can be missed in the colon. Um, the risk is pretty low, you know, it's on the order of, you know, two to two to five percent. Um, but um, you should be in contact with your primary care uh, doctor or even uh, a gastroenterologist, um, uh, you know, to be evaluated to see if uh, you need a colonoscopy because there is that small chance that a polyp could be missed. Um, and if a polyp is missed, like we discussed before, um, the, uh, the uh, adenoma, that, that polyp um, could become cancerous. So definitely uh, discuss things with your primary care doctor, even if you had your colonoscopy done recently. Thank you for your time tonight. We You're sure welcome. appreciate all the information. And um, yeah. we just want to say that we've come to the end of our time. And a recording of tonight's lecture will be available at bch.org backslash live stream in a couple of days. You will receive a post-lecture survey by email Please take a minute to fill this out. Thank you for joining us and have a good night.